a young Brian Jones played perhaps the first slide guitar ever to be heard in Britain at Corners Club and very quickly tired of catching the coach in from Cheltenham. The next thing I heard from Brian was when he rang me up and said, I'm forming a band. So far, it's just me and Keith Richard on guitars. Do you want to be the singer? And I said, no. He couched his invitation in these terms. He said, we haven't been taking it seriously. I'm going to take it seriously from now on. I'm moving to London. I'm getting a flat. I'm forming a band, and I'm going to become rich and famous. And it was that last bit that I said, oh, Brian, come off it. You know, we're playing the blues, man. At the beginning of 1963, British electric blues was still a hard sell to audiences outside of jazz clubs, but by the end of that year, it had taken off big time, spearheaded by Brian's group, the Rolling Stones. We were the only young band doing it, and we were the only sort of real authentic band doing it, and doing it in jazz clubs. And then we got banned because they didn't like us, and young upstarts and thought we weren't authentic enough and we were doing, doing it too poppy. Um, and then we moved into the ballrooms and all that and, and created a, a new music for England. This first number we're going to do is a John Lee Hooker original. It's called Boom Boom, this one. By 1964, British rhythm and blues had hijacked every venue in the country. It was the live music. The Stones, the Yardbirds, Manfred Mann, the Animals. The way you talk! Whisper in my ear. Tell me that you love me. You knock me out. Right the Animals, a Newcastle-based band, were part of a nationwide blues explosion. London was mecca, but the blues could now be heard in every British city. A young musician from Belfast called Van Morrison pitched up at Soho's Marquee Club with his R&B band, Them. But not everyone was as reverential. There were a lot of people who felt you had to faithfully copy the record, um, which seemed to us to be pretty ludicrous. You know, and if you did mess with it, you were considered an irreligious punk. I mean, I know we bastardised the 12 bar quite badly, um, and we, we put a lot of power cording in and crescendos. <laughs> but also feeding off an audience that wanted that as well. They wanted to swing from the rafters, they wanted to go crazy bananas. I mean, we were 18, and the people who came to see us were 18, they didn't want to, you know, they wanted something with more energy. So we did Big Boss Man, you know, three times the speed. But I mean, isn't that what the blues is as well? I mean, that's, even when I saw it played, you know, in ramshackle clubs in, in the southern states of America, you know, there was that same electricity. I mean, we were white kids playing to white kids. But actually, you know, I sense that there was still the same vibe going on, all those thousands of miles apart. They loved the music, they wanted to play it, they worked out how it did, it came out differently, it will. If I'm white and grew up in South London, it's bound to be different to what, you know, but... I mean, Cyril Davis and everybody, they were great, they were brilliant, but... They, there was something missing, though, wasn't there, there? there? was... And it didn't connect with our sort of... I mean, age group. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe that's well, I really don't think yeah. it did, you know. It was something... It's almost like for a museum. Well, they were older. Yeah, they were, they were older, older. They were older, they were older than us. And all the artists were older. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, we were, we, were, we were sort of listening to records by 50-year-old blokes, you know, and therefore why, you know, there's no way we could have replicated that and it had been enough. In 
In a frantic 12 months, ravenous white British blues bands carved up and redistributed the Black Blues songbook. The whole locker got raided very quickly, didn't it? Uh, of blues songs and... Uh, I mean, how much of it was jumping on bandwagons? Dick Taylor, he used to play with us. I mean, I know that he was no jumper of bandwagons. Everybody had their sort of their stocking trade. Yeah. And we avoided smokestack lightning or something because the Yardies did it and, you know, Little Red Rooster Stones did it. And, but you picked your way around and came up with your own repertoire. The Yardbirds followed us on, you know, they used to ask us questions all the time and say, what strings do you use? And, you know, when you do that Little Water song, how does the middle go, you know? And, and they'd, in the intervals, they'd come and chat chat to us and ask all these questions. We actually made a conscious decision that we weren't going to play the sort of music the Rolling Stones were doing. You know, and as far as the animals up north, that might have been in another country, you know. I mean, you just, you just didn't really kind of worry about that or even necessarily relate to it. I mean, here, we did learn our stuff, though. We did learn our stuff. And uh, quite honestly, the blues ain't just necessarily black. <laughs> On its journey from the American South to Southern England, the blues, in the wake of Beatlemania, had become a horny teenage music, something the purists weren't happy about. White kids stealing black music for their own needs. You know, was it racially dodgy? We didn't even think about it. I mean, you know, why would you think about that at that time? I mean, you just, you didn't, you know. There's a sociological background, you know, to the, to the blues and what happened and what the people felt and so on and so forth, um, that make it what it is, is very important. And, and it's, I don't think it's, it's right to, to just take bits of it as trappings. I mean, I think you owe it to the people who you admire to, not to screw their music up. The new teenage audience for British electric blues was yet again entirely white. We, we didn't appeal to uh, a black audience at all. Though funnily enough, when Paul Jones and I were first trying to get a band together, we were rehearsing in a pub in Collier's Wood, South London, and um, the landlord came up and said, uh, the band I've booked to play downstairs uh, haven't turned up, and would you like to play? Uh, and we went down and played, and we were greeted with stunned indifference, but then, a black man came in at the back of the bar and he probably got a pint of Guinness and stood there and we saw that he was tapping his foot. And honestly, we felt so good that one person in that audience was enjoying what we were attempting to do and he was black. British blues players weren't themselves black and didn't appeal to black audiences. But their love of the music led them to identify themselves with the black man's burden, something far weightier than anything suburban Britain could offer. They never were sharecroppers. They never li lived in, in abject poverty. They didn't have to go and sit on a, on a stoop in the middle of a, a, a tiny little town in Texas like Blind Emperor Je Jefferson did with a cup, you know, to, to get nickels and dimes and even pennies, you know. I mean, you know, they didn't have to do that. This is what I find absolutely so extraordinary, that the white British blues thing that developed, developed in this, mainly in this genteel area of southern England. I mean, how ridiculous is that? I suppose one did feel a certain sympathy, empathy or something with, with, with people who were oppressed. But I was never oppressed. I mean, that's stupid. It was the romanticism of it, I suppose, to some extent. Wow, look how horribly those people were treated. Boy, I, I'm with them. In the early 60s, being with them and being desperate to feel something meant knowing about the American civil rights movement and the violent struggles to end slavery and segregation. It was a, a cool celeb, wasn't it, of, of our generation? Reading James Baldwin and, and well, that's what you did as a, as a you know, a, a young adult in, in, the, in the 60s, really. Most of the people I knew who were into R&B really knew what was going on in America in terms of civil rights. And, uh, you know, we all knew how, how uh, black people were treated. 
I mean, that's why it was probably dangerous white young intellectuals going down trying to find old black men in Mississippi. You know, at that time you had the civil rights and you might end up in the swamp. This is Paul Oliver, who was the blues writer. And he was very much in evidence in those days. He, he, had, he and his wife Valerie, they'd been to the States and done a, a tour of the South and recorded a lot of people and interviewed people. It's been in rehearsals at, uh, at the Albert Hall for a concert. And it's important to get the history down, you know. The people were very serious about it. Yeah, this she got a pornograph And it won't sell on somewhere For some musicians, it was also important to get the precise sound down. Exactly, if at all possible. These records were what we were trying to attain, the sound of it, the feel of it, the whole concept of it. But because none of us, including me at that time, had ever been to America and ever walked into a recording studio, we had no concept of how they made their records. Where to put the microphone, get the sound of the room, you know, where John Lee Hooker would put his foot. Put the microphone a little further back. Because you could hear on Johnson's like where they deliberately pulled the microphone back to get more guitar. And so he's wailing over the top and there's others where it's almost in his face. Whatever you do, it's never going to sound like the American records because these are black artists who are from the South, who have a, a sound vocally that is uniquely theirs and that is part of, the, of what we talk about as being the blues. Um, and to recreate that is almost an impossibility. 